So welcome to the first track in the Juju Room and Comic Management Camp. Uh, I want to give a couple things real quickly. Uh, for those of you who are trying things out or may not have set up Juju previously, or maybe you're maxing out your laptop's ability to run stuff locally with Linux containers, we do offer cloud credentials. So if you go to developer.juju.solutions, uh, just sign up there. By the end of the day, you'll get a set of AWS or GCE credentials. It gives you access to about 10 instances. They live for 48 hours. They're meant for testing and playing around. But if you're interested in getting started with distributed systems and modeling with things like Juju and stuff, <coughs> it's a great way to get started without incurring too much cost on your hand. Uh, also, if you don't have the Wi-Fi password, it's uh, CFGMGMT at uh, Hogan. It's the password for the network. And then we have lightning talks again today. We have two signed up. If you want to join? They're about five to ten minutes, depending on how complex your talk is. And we just kind of go up, show something cool, demonstration, the things you're working on. Uh, so if you want to, come talk to anyone in an orange shirt. They'll help you get signed up. And then finally, this track is going to focus on a couple of core sections. Um, so Juju itself is interesting as a tool, but really what we find is that most people are actually solving problems like deploying and managing Kubernetes, OpenStax, big data, and then general operators concerns. So you'll see during the tracks today and tomorrow that they all preface with one of those key items. So if you're curious, if you're interested in one of those topics, you might want to hit those rooms. Uh, finally, at the very end of the hall down there, we have a workshop room. So if the talks aren't too enticing or not a subject matter you want to learn too much about, you can go back there. We'll have a bunch of people in orange shirts from the community uh, and from Canonical that can help solve problems. You have questions about Juju, questions about Ubuntu, about any one of these subject areas, and more. Go back in that room, walk in and say hi to people over there, start chatting with them. But we can sit down, work on laptops as more of a hacking session kind of design. So that's our parallel track for workshops and such. It's unscheduled, come in uh, and work through things. Um, anything else to say, George? No. Cool, awesome. So we'll get started. This is the first talk of the day. Uh, and like most of the times that we've come to the Config Manager Camp or Rhino Solutions, we're going to give you like a quick overview of what we see as open source operations and where the industry is trending towards. And ultimately, where it's trending towards is that software itself is fundamentally changing. It's entering a point where the way software is consumed, the way it's written, the way it's deployed, the way it's managed, everything about software is changing shape. It's no longer the days where you go call up an enterprise and they give you a license key and you get a giant bundle of software in the mail and it's like 20,000 floppy disks or CD-ROMs that you plug into a mainframe. And even so 10 years ago where it's usually just one piece of thing that you install, one or two pieces of applications on a server and then you've got something. Today it's much, much more complex. It's, uh, it's not just more complex, but it's also cheaper to run, which is something that's super interesting. <laughs> so what we see happening a lot is the way software is being delivered is such that it varies not just in the type of softwares, but where you're actually delivering it to. And that's mostly been divided into things like cloud architecture. So you've got applications that you're installing on clouds. They scale out. They've got a bunch of IP addresses. There's pools of them. And we see that today, not just in these solutions, but in a ton of other things, where it's a complex, at scale, elastic uh, set of things, consuming multiple resources, typically on hardware, either in the cloud or on local premise. And we also have a set of hardware, uh, software that's being delivered to things that we call devices. Uh, this, this edge, this transactionality of this edge device, where you've got one device running a piece of code through this IoT space, but you've got robots, drones, Nest sensors on your on your house, security cameras, all those things are running software. And despite the fact that it is software, it's delivered and consumed in much different ways. So we're going to focus a lot in this track about how to handle software in the hyper cloud elasticity. But it's not just not just as software going through this evolution, but it's going through an evolution in two different forks in this road on how you consume and deliver these things. And because of that, software itself is plummeted as the cost for implementation. Right now, you can go and find any problem that you want to solve. On GitHub today, I can guarantee you'll find 10 or 15 solutions that are open source and implemented. It's free. You can go grab it, you can install it, you can play with it. The problem that's really coming is that the cost for software today is not so much with the actual license fees for these things, but it's the cost of operating these pieces. They're so much more complex. They're so much more varied than they were before. As a result of that, it takes a lot more time, more skill, and more people to manage what was normally done by a much smaller team with much higher software costs. No longer are the days of paying millions of dollars out to Oracle for a database server. Today you can go and find at least 45 trending database servers that all have different pros and cons. And it's really coming down to the knowledge to know which one to pick for your solution 
And then how to manage that, go deep and manage the operations for that, how to deploy it, how to make it robust, how to scale it. All of those things become quite costly in learning, uh, in learning curves. So this basically summarizes exactly what we're seeing. No more are we seeing this idea of multiple components, uh, of one or two components being strung together. Instead, today's software topologies are super complex. They're super diverse, and they're diverse across a wide range of stacks, across not just 10 machines, but hundreds, if not thousands of machines. Uh, if you look at things like OpenStack and Kubernetes and Big Data, you'll find that an OpenStack is actually 23 different individual components all interconnected and deployed at varying scales. You have some that are just three machines, some across hundreds of machines, and all of those need to be interconnected, com configured appropriately with each other, and work in concert in order to provide a single OpenStack. Very similar things can be said with things like Kubernetes and the varying big data solutions and other software out there. And this is really what's coming to that leap is that this is the idea of big software. Software is not a single component, but it's actually a big complex orchestration of multiple factors of application interconnected with each other. And so we like to think of this era as the big software era. And because of that, it takes a different mentality to tackle how you install and manage and deploy these pieces of software. It takes something like a model, what we've seen before, the idea of the physical, the, the virtual representation of how these components are connected, how they're deployed, how they're configured, where they're located, Modeling makes it so that you can actually take a, uh, a logical representation of this, and if you can execute that logical representation, you suddenly have a way to tractably deploy and manage these model, uh, these applications. So, like I mentioned before, here's just a couple of examples of big software today, and we see a lot rising. I would probably fill the slide up with new technologies, but for the most part, the, the, the most invested technologies today we see are things like OpenStack, Kubernetes, uh, Hadoop's data represent the entire big data ecosystem, which is large and encompassing. And then Mesos, which is uh, much like the OpenStack Kubernetes side, another infrastructure layer for container management. All of these things are very complex interleaved components that take quite a lot of skill set and time to deploy. And not just deploy, but also manage. So, because we can model things like applications like this, we can actually start saying, well, models are really just the abstraction of logical layer. Models should be able to work not just for different software scenarios and verticals, but also different OSs. Why shouldn't I be able to not model things like Active Directory for Microsoft and Microsoft SQL Server alongside my application on CentOS and my load balancer on Ubuntu? All of those things should be allowed and, and should be tractable because models give us a way to impact that virtual representation onto the physical layer. And because models also give us that abstraction layer, we can also say, I want to not just replay this in different operating systems, but why not be able to replay this also on a set of different clouds? I should be able to do the same thing on Amazon as I do on Google, as I do on Bare Metal, as I do on LexD and VMware. So with this new era of big software, we also gain a lot of new properties by modeling these applications and their complexity. So for this, present, for this track, we'll be talking about two different distinct concepts. There's the concept of installing software, software, modern software today, software that's complex like these topics. And to do that, we're going to be using and showing a lot of a tool called ConjureUp. ConjureUp is there to help you get started quickly with modeling the initial implementation you want for things like uh, complex pieces of software. How, uh, how many machines of this component do I want? What's the configuration I want to set for these things? How do I connect these pieces together? That initial setup and, and model drawn are all done today with something we call ConjureUp. Then when it comes to actually managing that, what happens after the first week, second week, the third month, the fourth month? We use Juju to help drive and, and manipulate and mutate that model over time. So let's see, how do I go and install a new component? Or how do I change the size <coughs> of this component? How do I configure these things? These two tools are things we'll have feature heavily in these tracks that help solve a lot of these problems today. So I'm going to walk you just a couple of demos real quickly on conjuring up and managing some deployments to give you an idea of what's possible and what will be shown off for the rest of the track. And then we'll go on with a couple of exciting new things coming that are worth note. So. I've got a laptop here. I've gone ahead and installed ConjureUp. Oh, make it a little bigger. Uh, so I'm just going to type ConjureUp. And what this is going to do is going to present me with a list of things that I can go and set up today. So ConjureUp has a bunch of starting entry points, a bunch of boilerplate templates that you can use to start your deployments. Things like uh, an Apache Hadoop cluster with Kafka, with Spark, 
a straight cluster, some syslog analytics and real-time uh, monitoring, a Spark cluster, uh, we've got Kubernetes clusters. My term was a little too small. You can deploy a core set of Kubernetes. You can deploy a, a, our console distribution of Kubernetes. There are things like OpenStacks. You can deploy OpenStacks with different hypervisors um, and things like MySQL blogs and stuff like that. So for this, we're gonna kind of walk through what it looks like to deploy and manage a Kubernetes setup. So I'm just gonna type, um, I'll give you the same options here. Uh, so I'm gonna do just a core Kubernetes. This is just a small minimum set of things with Kubernetes and we're gonna go and make a few modifications. So the first thing it's gonna ask me to is where do I wanna put this? Uh, I've already got a bunch of clouds modeled, but if I wanted to, I could go and create a new deployment. I can say I wanna do this on that cloud abstraction layer. There's AWS, Azure, Cloud Sigma, Google Joint, Rackspace, a bunch of new ones that I can add in as well, including my, <coughs> my, my, my laptop for the sake of time. Uh, I'm going to just run this on an existing deployment that I have. So we're gonna do this on top of EU Central 1, which is the German Germany AWS region. From here, it tells me the things that are comprised in this application. So to deploy Kubernetes, actually what you're gonna be deploying is, uh, you'll be deploying a Kubernetes master, the API control plane, uh, a Kubernetes worker, this is where you do all of your Docker runs and such, this is your compute plane, uh, Flannel, which is an SDN overlay network for communication between containers. etcd, the data store that backs Kubernetes, it's a distributed database service. And then finally, EasyRSA, which gets you that uh, private key infrastructure, so you can generate TLS certificates, have them be valid instead of self-signed certificates, so you can actually secure your cluster. So in ConjureUp, as my starting point for these things, I can go and change the architecture for these. I could say, ah, I want EasyRSA placed here. I can change the scale, I could say, well, uh, etcd is great in one node, but if you want it to be robust, you really need at least three, preferably five nodes. So I can say for this architecture, I want to add some more machines. Uh, I can add some machines. I can add new. I can assign machines to here. I can say, oh, give me, give me more etcds. Um, I can change configuration. So if I wanted to manipulate the work configuration, um, to say, oh, here's. Here's what I need for proxies, if I wanna allow ingress, if I wanna use C groups, labels to apply to the cluster, uh, things of that nature, I can manipulate them here as well. Uh, and then finally, when I've gone down and done my initial setup, I can just deploy these applications. So what this is gonna do is conjure up, will go and fetch those packages, uh, set up those components in AWS, spins up the instances, configures them, uh, apply security groups, make sure they have root disk attached to them, I could have gone and changed the instance sizes if I'd like to. And we'll go and put all those components on them as I described the initial architecture. And in the next five, 10 minutes or so, depending on how slow the Wi-Fi and the cloud is that I'm connecting, I'll have a running Kubernetes cluster that I can start poking at. Um, the same thing can be repeated for things like OpenStack, for Big Data, for any number of complex deployment topologies where it takes quite a lot of time to do the initial architecture and deployment. It can be wrapped down and still pretty quickly using things like Contra. So while this is running, I'm gonna move over to an existing cluster. Um, so this is what that cluster looks like. I've got an, I got a new model that's being deployed. It's called Conjure of Kubernetes Core. As you can see, all these things are still pending. They're still being spun up. I have spun this up just a few minutes ago here. Uh, so here's an already running cluster. Everything's green, everything's done. I can go and download my credentials for Kubernetes and start actually running workloads or putting things like DAS and PASs on top, or adding things using Helm to deploy packages through Kubernetes, or piping this into my CI CD pipeline. Um, and what I can do now is I can use things like this UI or the Juju command line to start changing and manipulating these things. If I wanted to add additional capacity, um, right now I only have one worker, so I wanna actually go and give myself two more workers to have three. I'll just have it automatically place it. I can tell it, oh, use this many CPU cores, this much RAM. I'm just gonna have the default instances done. I'll commit these changes. I see that I've got two new machines coming up as a result. And what this will do is scale out these components. So in the machine section, I have two. In a few minutes, you'll see two more pop up, as they just did. And so Juju's going now and provisioning those machines in the cloud layer, adding those components into there, and then making sure they're configured, not just configured, um, locally, but also connected to the TLS data store. They'll get their own certificates and the right CA public route so they can communicate with the cluster. They'll know where the Kubernetes master API control plane is. 
All that stuff is taken care of because we've taken the time to model exactly how these connections, how these, um, uh, how these integrations are done. And by doing so, we can replay, manipulate, and change this model and be able to see the effects of that without having to manually intervene with any of the components. And this can be done on any of the software stacks today. So if you're deploying more than one or two applications in concert, doing it with things like Juju allow you to distill how to actually do the installation, but also how to do these lifecycle maintenance tools. So for an example, if you're trying to maintain something like a Kubernetes cluster and you need to take a machine offline, you've got a bunch of workloads running in it, you need to make sure that you not only evacuate all those Docker workloads somewhere else, but then you mark that node as no longer being able to schedule workloads. So you can say, ah, cordon this node off, I can't put anything on here, uh, evacuate all the machines all the machines running off of there, and then once it's empty, you can now take the machine offline, do hardware repairs, you can just nuke it altogether and remove it to not have to worry about downtime. So because we have these circles, these encapsulations of these common practices, and really what this, is, this comes down to is this operational knowledge of how do I install, manage, and configure over time these components? You can actually start interacting with the cluster in a very standardized way instead of SSHing in and poking around and making these snowflakes of deployments that are very hard to repeat. You can use Juju as a way to do these repeatable distilled actions and operations, which makes your life much easier, much repeatable. And since these are all open source operations, you can actually observe the code, change it, and share those with other people. Let's see if our cluster is up and running. But we're still getting there. So it's installing some components for us. We're waiting for machines to still spawn, installing the software to do this deployment. Um, but that is effectively what things like Conjure Up and Juju allow you to do, is this, this distillation of the operations it takes to manage clusters over time in a repeatable fashion. All these components are, are unique components. This is a single chunk of code that describes the operations and integrations for each of these components. <laughs> Uh, anyone can go grab those today, modify them, submit to them, um, and use them in different varying solutions. The same etcd you see here is the same etcd that's used throughout our different stacks. If you're deploying Calico, that connects directly into the Calico backend for their control plane. If you're using uh, anything else that plugs in the etcd, it generically provides you an etcd endpoint. It has no idea it's etcd in Kubernetes or etcd in, in SDN or etcd in another solution. So, that is, at a high level, what Juju <coughs> provides. And we'll be going a lot deeper into a lot of these concepts over the next two days with different varying talks. Um, and so Juju today provides you those core primitives. It gives you the ability to deploy, to request compute resources, to put these operation codes on there, to scale and relate and manipulate, to create distinct models of deployments. Uh, one thing I didn't show. So for example, I have here a Kubernetes. I have here a big data cluster. Um, this is just a set of components that are all interlinked again and deployed. I've got this separate model. This is like namespaces, essentially, where there are different components deployed using the same control plane, but different segmented namespaces. So what does the future of modeling look like in this respect? What's, what's coming in Juju 2.1, which is coming out in about a month? Soon, any day. Soon, very soon. Um, so this is what we have today, this is Juju 2.0, this is 2.0.2 to be exact. In 2.1, there's a lot of cool new features coming, but we're gonna highlight a few that are really enticing that might be super interesting for people here today. So the first one is model migration. Um, we didn't dive too deeply into what's happening behind the scenes, but Juju sets up a controller, and that controller operates in that cloud, and it does all the event dispatching, Juju being an event-driven system. Uh, so all those little circles that are deployed on that screen, they're all sending and receiving events from the controller, and that controller is helping managing the states uh, and the actions taken in that cluster. Uh, but there are cases where you may want to actually migrate controllers. If you have a bunch of models, we only have three running in ours, but let's say you have hundreds of models, different namespaces effectively for these deployments, and you wanted to help load balance, uh, you wanted to help evacuate the control plane in order to do maintenance on the, the, the machines running on the control plane, uh, in 2.1 you'll be able to migrate models. So we could say something like, ah, this Kubernetes model we just created, it's time for that one to migrate to a new controller. I controller here running, it's an HA already, it's all set up, it's pristine, and then with Juju you can say, Juju migrate that controller, and what happens, that model, what happens is the model will simply just show up over there, and it'll use that new controller for its control plane. So it's at the level of robustness and professionalism in Juju that makes it really easy to maintain in production. Uh, it's one of the feature requests we had most for the last cycle, so uh, this is one of the things that we put on there to tackle. It helps with um, all this stuff and more as far as the migration perspective. 
The next feature coming in 2.1, which is super exciting, is cross-model relations. Um, and so this one's kind of hard to explain, but the idea is simple, where if I have, uh, if I'm deploying multiple Kubernetes clusters, unique clusters, I don't want to deploy a copy per, uh, per se of etcd over and over and over again. I want to use a single etcd cluster that I maintain. It's got five nodes, or on beefy machines, it can handle all these smaller clusters I'm deploying. What I can do is put etcd inside of a single model, <coughs> and then have it communicate with other models that I've deployed. So while it's not in the same model, they'll be able to share across them. Another example is a database server. So if you're using MySQL, you have a bunch of web apps that you have deployed. You say, this model, this team manages, this model, this team manages. And we have a set of DBs, DB admins, those grisly fellows in the back room that like to scoff at all your queries and complain about performance of the cluster. Those guys have access to their own model. And what we'll do is we'll give them access to the database they can go and make the configuration changes they need to support the rest of those things without actually having to let these people, these crazy web people in the front that are all wrapping their stuff in Docker, that are deploying a bunch of applications all the time, they can just connect to it as an endpoint. Say, ah, I'm gonna connect to the DB cluster over there that these guys are giving me access to. So we're allowing you to separate the concerns of different namespaces and different models and then create the communications across those. So that way you have a team managing and adminning one model, but giving write access or read access into that model from, uh, from across the application. So it's a way to, to slim down resources and have repeatability across your cluster. And we're also working on making operating Juju easier, which I'm gonna let uh, Rick explain to you. So this is Rick Harding, Juju engineer. He's gonna come explain how we're making the operation of Juju much easier. Awesome. So if you guys wanna get started with Juju today, you can, you can grab the Juju command and bootstrap and pick your, your cloud of choice, whether it be locally with LexD, um, Maz for bare metal, uh, any of the public clouds that are supported, you know, go get stuff done. Um, but uh, that means you're going to get yourself a controller. And this is, as Marco says, your control plane for Juju. It tracks all the actual state and you have many models in that controller and that's great. Because you're gonna use this for production at some point and so you wanna make sure that that thing's HA, right? Because my control plane can't go down because like what's mentioned in the keynote this morning, what happens when all your stuff goes boom and then how do you un unfubar everything? Uh, but not only that, if you're gonna have stuff in production in HA, well then you have to monitor and watch it, right? Is my HA functioning? Um, are my, is my uh, endpoint uh, for my HTTP connection for my clients all up and ready and connecting and working? Um, how's my disk space doing? Is, am I gonna run out of disk space soon and my database will blow up and get very, very unhappy? And so it starts to add up a little bit. You know, you have, um, we've done a lot of work for improving the operations of software that you deploy with Juju and, and that you manage it, that you operate it over time with actions and all those kind of tools, but you have to worry about, you know, Juju itself. Who, uh, who watches the watchers? Um, and then on top of that, you start to then go, I want to do this in different substrates. I want to replicate this on GCE, on Azure, on AWS. So this was great, but one thing that we wanna to try to get uh, folks here and let you guys know about something that's kind of coming that's a little bit early. There's a little beta thing that you guys can all help me out with. Uh, if you go to jujucharms.com, there's a little link in the, uh, in the top in the header there for the sign up for the beta. And what this is, is a beta for a hosted Juju offering. So the idea being that rather than you running the controllers in HA monitor, you can actually um, let us, well, we have operations guys doing the work. So it's a great way to get started. If you want to play with Juju, you don't need your own controller. You just bring your own credentials to whatever cloud to run, this, run the infrastructure you want to run, and we'll take care of the Juju part for you. So you can do this today. Go click this, go to jujuterms.com, and you'll get this little page where it asks for your email address. <coughs> um, at the end, I'll give you notes. Let me know that you signed up for the beta here, and I can make sure that you get in sooner rather than being on a waiting list for down the road, right? So advantages of being here in person, come let me know and I'll get you signed up and get you taken care of. But go put your email in so that you have, that you're in the system. So what is it gonna do? Um, it's gonna let you basically run, uh, you're gonna basically get a new controller, which is, uh, it looks like a normal controller, right? So when you add this, you'll see a controller. Um, what you'll basically do is register uh, this is a command for sharing a controller with another person. Um, you can kind of see how this works. We're running the controller. We will share it with you, basically. So you'll register this gym.jujutarms.com, which will make sure you log in and verify your account and everything. And then from there, you'll have to manage your credentials. So the credentials are basically the API you know, keys that will be charged for the actual running uh, infrastructure. 
So you have to add the credential and, and see that, and I'll show you this in a second here. Um, and the other thing is just so right now in the beta, we currently have controllers we're managing in the following regions uh, on the big three clouds. Um, so when we get to actually using this, there's a little bit of you know beta limitations that will expand over time throughout the beta program to eventually all the regions on all the clouds will have uh, controllers running and operating so you can deploy whatever you like and manage it wherever you want it. You obviously see the you know, kind of desire to make yourself resilient by having things running on one cloud with a fallback of another, you know? It uh, really lets you kind of start to truly make things full failover. You know, it, it doesn't happen often, but I don't know how you guys remember when AWS US East actually did go down. Um, it's been known to happen. So, um, and then basically once you're registered, you get your credential there, you would just use normal Juju uh, syntax for everything. You would create a model. So here I have a command for adding a config management camp model uh, I would specify the region I want it to be in. This would be on AWS and US East 1. And then my credential is just Rick's AWS. And from here on out, you're just interacting with Juju like you would locally. It's the same exact tool, the same exact experience everywhere else, except that you don't have to run those controllers anymore. Um, and then those models you create will just appear when you run the Juju models command. You'll see all of your models that you've got. And what's great is that um, you'll see them in the different clouds. So it's kind of a unique experience because when you run the models, you actually see them running in different places. So let's go swap displays here and show oh, what this kind of sort of looks like. There we go. When all else fails, restart. All right, so here I have gone to jujucharms.com and I have logged into my account. This uses the normal Ubuntu SSO login. Um, if you have an account on Launchpad or you've done anything else with the Ubuntu world, you probably have an account. If not, easy and free to create one. And what you can see here is I've actually got three different models uh, running here. I've got Config Management and a Config Management Azure. And basically, these, this Config Management one, if you go ahead and load the GUI from that, I can see that this is running in AWS, the little icon that's getting squished due to my resolution here. Um, I can see I've got a Kubernetes running, uh, our Kubernetes core that, that Marco kind of linked to earlier. Um, I can even go through and see that you know, this is an actual running, like this is the actual uh, UI running on my live Kubernetes in Azure. But what's great now is I can go down here and I can not just switch between my models here, but my models on any cloud that I've got in my, my, my uh, hosted Juju here. So here on Azure, I've deployed the Elk stack because I want to basically stick all my monitoring stuff here. Maybe I'll then connect it and wire it up to my models and other clouds and really allows you to be very flexible and diverse and fail over safe in how you set up and, and, and operate things. Um, and just to kind of flesh out those commands I was talking about. So forgive my giant font here, but here you can see I registered with the controller as, oh, no, you're not seeing that. The controller there is Juju Charms. That's just, you can give it whatever name you want when you register. And so if I check my models, um, ignore the error thing. This is part of the lovely beta. I'm running the 2.1 beta 4. I need to upgrade to 5 that came out uh, over the weekend here. Um, so you can see I've got my two models there, my config management and my config uh, Azure. Notice that it actually, I don't know why I named it Azure <coughs> because it tells me that it's in the cloud region that it's in, um, that everything's running. And then, just to status up my uh, config management one that's that's uh, working there, and so here you can see everything running active, and pretty darn happy. Uh, so while you're here, please reach out. Let's let's play with this, try out. Let's get some new users and stuff in the beta program. Um, we think this is a great way to get started with Juju, a little bit easier, a little more cost effective, um, and should be some fun. So. Since we switch laptops. No, oh, sorry. Right. I'll just figure. So um, feedback, you can uh, file bugs and file feedback from the beta program. Um, I have the GitHub account for uh, canonical limited Um And hopefully this all fits on here, and it doesn't. Yeah, there I got you. All right. So just some, oh, he's going to swap over. So some links, we're at Juju, Pound Juju on Freenode. Um, there's a Juju mailing list. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to myself, uh, rick.harding at canonical.com. 
and uh, let us know if you have any questions, problems getting started, or just want to play with it. Oh, and I wanted to call out Martin is in the other room. In another room, in another session. Darn. But yeah. All right, LV. LV is part of Martin's team doing research um, as far as getting feedback on designs and the user experience and stuff. So please, uh, if you see them and you have opinions, don't hesitate to reach out to them. They would love to get your opinions and uh, put them on the list. So we can make things better. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Anything they may want to see deployed or things they are experiencing now that are kind of tough that they want to see maybe how that translates? So I wanted to I wanted to correct Marco there. It's behind a feature flag in Juju 2.1. It's oh, being yeah. developed so for 2.2, yeah. right? So it's a, it's a beta feature. The access model, um, what that is that you, we have ACLs in Juju, you have the user database in Juju. Um, right now, the current uh, feature flag thing is if you have access to the model that, you, uh, that the other thing is in, so if I'm an admin of the database uh, admin model, I can relate to it just invisibly, right? The database admins can grant me access to that application from that model. So if I'm a DB admin and you are a web guy, I can grant you access to the actual endpoint on the database as a DB admin and go, you know what, you can have that. And then from there you can, there's a, a, an alternative command, you can relate directly. Um, the other way is you can actually just add it to your model with um, consume is the command. You can juju consume, DB model, uh, DB model dot Postgres, and it will then appear in your model, and then you can relate to it and do things to it like you normally would, except obviously you don't have control over the configuration or the scale, how many units it is or all that. It's just there for you to see in your model, to be able to um, export that as bundles that you can reuse later, that you can, you know, that you can kind of uh, use in your operations. <coughs> Almost uh, very much like a hosted service. At that point, you're kind of getting Postgres as a service from your DB admin team to all your other teams in there. So the access, anyways, yeah, the ACLs are, are the main access there. And um, is, is a cross-model relationship a special relationship? Like, do you have to say in MySQL this relationship is allowed to be cross-model? Um, so if, um, so the question was, yeah, sorry, the questions. Uh, the question is, is that, is it a special relationship? Um, and yes and no. Um, it is a special relationship because you can set ACLs and stuff on it, which normally um, aren't available. Uh, Networking-wise, there's some peculiarities. So the, the current cross-model relation feature requires things to be on the same network um, because if you relate to something and it's on a different network, the question of what address is it at is different. It's a more complicated question. How do I get to it and such? Um, but other than that, no. As far as the charms, the, the actual operations of codes is just concerned, it just, you you get a straight, normal Juju relation communication protocol over the wire. Yeah, and you have to be either write permissions or admin permissions to give yourself. I, I'm pretty sure right now you have to be an ad, you have to be admin on that model. Um, for the assumed, I can just relate to it and then it's just a name space, right? It's model name dot application name and then you can just use it like you would a normal DB, uh, Juju relate command. Right, but in the final version, there'll be ACLs where you can say, I'm just going to explicitly offer this endpoint to that user, and they don't have to be an admin on the model to consume it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. Um, I have no pre previous experience to Juju, but I have a question. Um, how, what kind of versioning and like uh, all the things does Juju have? Like, for instance, I see a lot of examples stuff in the command line and then get a pop up with uh, something next next next. Oh so I mean so basically someone has done something, where is mm -hmm. the track of that? Is it version can you store it in a config file sure. for reuse and stuff like that? So so the question is basically uh, I'm gonna gonna rephrase it in the sense of where I'm gonna answer it is uh, what's the basically audit log situation? What is the re you know the I have my um, my configuration, my deployment, and everything set up. How do I version that from one version to another when I repeat it or change it or alter it? Is that the gist of your question there? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so 
there's a couple there's a couple angles to that. One is that um, when you run Juju, there everything is logged that happens within it. Um, there's an audit log that can be turned on, which tracks which users performed what operations when, um, as well. Now, as far as your model itself, models are able to be basically dumped out to a clean YAML format. And there, we call those bundles in our language. And basically, you have a, a YAML that is the deployment. When, when, we, when he showed I deployed a Kubernetes core, what it actually did is it grabbed a YAML representation of all the components, the configuration, how many units, what size constraints do the machines need to be. They need to have so many cores, so much RAM, and all that. That's all defined in that YAML. And when you pass that into Juju, it goes and just makes it happen, right? Um, and so those YAML files are able to be uh, yeah. Yeah. versioned and tracked and everything. So where do you store this YAML files? So oh, that's a good question. So to point out here, you've got versions for the applications you're running. So in this case, you're running Kubernetes 1.5.2 and yada, yada, yada. This is the revision of the actual operational code, the, the charm, that payload. Um, the bundles, like Rick was mentioning, is you can snapshot this model. You can say I'm using these charm revisions with these connections. It looks like this in YAML. And you can use that as a, as a snapshot of the version of the deployment. So you can repeatedly deploy the same operational code over and over and over again, the same snapshot of that model. And it looks something like, uh, Example. So this is what the model looks like for this one. There's a YAML file that's comprised of the names of each of the applications, the charm and the explicit revision of that charm. So this is the ECR, ACRSA charm revision 6, which deploys an application version alongside of that. And then these are the actual connections, the, the, the integrations that we model. The Kube master goes to the load balancer, load balancer goes to the worker. ECRSA connects to all of them. And so you can snapshot the model in YAML and use it to replay over and over again when you, you, you deploy right. from my YAML file. So you can keep them locally however you wish within your, within your own team. Um, what Mark was just showing was the charm store where you can actually publish those bundles of things. So the canonical, uh, the, the Kubernetes there is our, this is our default stack for getting a Kubernetes going. It's shared through the charm store. Anyone can just you deploy that and it'll go out, from, fetch it from the store and deploy it or you can provide your own local copy of the YAML file. So as um, the, the Kubernetes team at Canonical updates what is that default deployment, I think there's a talk later on specifically on how that's migrated over time and, and the model has changed over time. Um, they can update it in the store and, and you get those you know, updates to everyone else. Okay. Cool. Uh, we have about one minute left, so any final questions? If not, um, if you have a lot of questions about Juju, I'll get you in a second. Yeah. We'll be in the workshop room next door as well, so feel free to keep attending the talks. If the talk doesn't really entice you too much, find us in the workshop room. We're happy to work through more questions, get you set up and using Juju real quickly so you can start playing around a bit more. Uh, yeah, question. Uh, back to cross model relations. Um, does cross model always be the same controller or over different controllers? And so for, for, the, beta, for the, the current feature flag, it is the same controller. Um, as you can, I mean, it's obvious where we want to go, right? The idea being is if, if I'm using the hosted Juju, for instance, and I have my things across different clouds that I would want to relate them across those clouds, uh, there's a lot of workloads that lean towards that, be it um, your monitoring system. You want to run one monitoring system and monitor a lot of different stuff in different areas, right? You know, uh, stuff like that, compliance systems and all that, where you want one of them and you want to kind of wire those stuff across a lot of different places. So that's definitely where we want to go. This one.
that yes, we have some magic that does some extra stuff. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks so much for the questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>